Okay, so we are reading uh, Agora, the left hand of God. We are on chapter four, Ran Bandhana. Rin page Bandhan. number one one five of the book and uh, page sixty of the PDF. Can anyone tell me the pronunciation of this? It's Rin Bandhan. Yes, it is Rin Bandhan. Rin Bandhan, na Rinu kyu yes. aaja raha hai? That you I'm getting confused. It's over here. Word. He has written it as Rinu Bandhan. स्टार्ट So you have to start with the page. I've already started. I've announced it already. Sorry. Even if you could know when you would die, and only a few yogis can know, there is no likelihood that you'll be able to alter the time or the circumstances. Because even if you try to make some changes, Mahakal will make use of your Rinanu Bandhan to create the situation as he desires it. he will pervert your mind and the minds of those around you to force events to occur as he pleases so now what is the what is happening here now in the gita classes we are constantly hearing about uh, sanchit vasnas and prarabdh vasnas right so now what manifests here is the prarabdh vasna now what he is saying here is that mahakal can create some of your sanchit vasnas to manifest in this lifetime also if he so desires so that he can guide you in the way that he wants you to be guided in this lifetime here's an example once there was a childless couple who prayed to shiva for many years before being blessed with a son when the father who was the local king's astrologer cast his son's horoscope he was horrified to learn that the boy would die on his ninth birthday after paying his parents 1 lakh rupees <clears throat> this was the rinanu bandhan between the boy and his parents the reason why he had been born into that family the boy's father was mystified as well where would a 9 year old boy come up with 1 lakh rupees he felt secure in the absurdity of the situation but just to make sure he never let the boy out of the house even to go to school so he could never amass any money still the boy learned something of astrology almost by default because his father was an expert and people came regularly to consult him off and on the boy would warn his wife sorry on and off the man would warn his wife never take anything from this boy and his wife would assure him she wouldn't When the boy became eight years old, the astrologer warned her again: "Make sure you never accept anything whatsoever from him." His wife replied, "I told you once, I will never take anything." At age eight years and eleven months, the astrologer delivered yet another warning to his wife and received the same assurance. Three days left. The father thought, when this period passes. the dangerous conjunction will not recur for at least 100 years nothing to worry about one day left again he cautioned his wife but he didn't realize that he was living in a fool's paradise mahakal always possesses his victim 6 months before the appointed time of death and makes the individual perform the actions which cause death to occur in the prescribed manner it was no different in this case the wife of that country's king had finally become pregnant after many years of barrenness just before the delivery was to occur the astrologer's son was strolling through the palace garden when he saw a gardener's wife collecting flowers he asked her in childish innocence where are you going with all these flowers she replied I am to take them to decorate the queen's bed chamber where she is about to give birth to a child. The little boy said, "I am coming along with you." The lady told him, "Only women are allowed." The boy said, "Make me wear a sari so I can come too." 
and looked at her so mournfully that she had to agree. Mahakal had taken possession of him and was ordering her. Otherwise, the gardener's wife would never have dared to take him along, knowing the stiff penalty she would have to face if the deception were discovered. Some Rinanu Bandhan had to exist between the boy and the gardener's wife, of course, to give Mahakal a field in which to operate. Off they went to the palace like mother and daughter. There, just at the moment of the child's birth, the little boy got inspiration from Mahakal and took a twig and wrote on the wall in the blood red juice of the pan, beetle leaf, beetle nut and beetle leaf mixture he was chewing. This boy will surpass his father in every way and will live for 125 years. Then he and the gardener's wife left. Ten minutes after the delivery, all the royal astrologers came, led by the little boy's father, and when they cast the horoscope, they all agreed. If the father ever sees the face of this child, the father must die. Well, what to do? The king could not afford to allow that to happen because the welfare of the kingdom was at stake. So he called two butchers and told them, take this child out and kill him. The queen felt grief but consoled herself. with the thought that her husband would continue to live and she could have more children. When the two butchers had taken the baby out into the forest, they said to one another, what has this child done that he should be murdered on the day he was born? They could not do the deed, so they left the child under a tree. They killed a deer instead and took its eyes to the king to prove that they had done the job. How could two bloodthirsty butchers become so compassionate? Mahakal, the god of death and a complex Rinanubandhan connecting the baby, the butchers and the luckless animal. By now, the king was feeling remorseful, guilty of the murder of an infant and his own son at that, and he was wondering what to do. The remorse? Mahakal's doing. He went to the queen and told her, I've done a terrible thing. She said, you, what have you lost? I've lost my baby. Suddenly, the king saw the horoscope written on the wall. When he read the words, he was so astonished that he called all his guards and ordered them to find out who had written it. They interrogated everyone who had been there and when they reached the gardener's wife, she admitted that the chief astrologer's young son had come in disguise and done so. Meanwhile, the boy had gone happily to his home and had had his nice food and was resting, as if he knew what was going to happen next. Suddenly, officers arrived and escorted him to the palace. The king confronted him with the writing on the wall and the boy boldly told him, What I have written cannot be wrong. The baby cannot be dead. A nine-year-old boy could never be so confident. Mahakal was speaking. At this, the king called in the two butchers who confessed after a good hiding that they had not killed the infant. The king and his whole court rushed to the tree and found the baby alive. Honey from an overhead honeycomb dripping into his mouth to satisfy his hunger. The astrologer's son told the king, You have seen your son's face and yet you live. The king was wonderstruck and asked, How could you be right when all my astrologers were wrong? The boy told him, I was present at the precise moment of birth. My father and all the rest were 10 minutes late. The king was so pleased that he wrote on a slip of paper, pay the bearer of this note 1 lakh rupees from the royal te treasury. The boy ran home as fast as he could calling for his mother. Ma, 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 when he got to his house, his mother met him at the door. He jumped into his arms, thrust the note into her hand and died. 
His father came home a few minutes later, having heard the whole story at court, and found his wife cradling their son's dead body. He shouted, You stupid wife, I told you never to take any money from him. But she said, how could I have known that the scrap of paper in his hand was a receipt? And then, of course, there was nothing to do about it. So there is no way to escape death unless you go beyond it. Please remember, the time of death is fixed for everyone. Even if you want to die earlier or later, you will not be able to. I remember a newspaper report. As soon as some young bride left her new home to visit her mother, her husband became so depressed that he decided to commit suicide. First, he swallowed all the poison in the house. Then he sealed all the doors and windows and turned on the gas. Since he didn't like the smell of gas, he went and bought some cigarettes and returned to the kitchen, where he lit one and bang. He was so frightened by the noise that, and fire that he vomited out all the poison and ran for his life. He was miraculously unscathed by the explosion and his wife had to get him out of jail for trying to burn down the house. And then there was another true story not too long ago. Some primary school teacher had been so fed up with his life for the past 10 years that he kept wanting to die but had never been able to do so. Then one day he found dead in a shiva he was found dead in a Shiva temple, embracing the Linga. He had searched for Mahakal for so long and had finally found him. Why didn't he succeed for 10 years? Because it was not yet time for him to die. No other explanation is possible. I have spent many long years of my life in the Smashan and I think I have found out a little something about death. You know, it really is a blessing that we do not have full knowledge of fate and Rinanu Bandhan, the workings of birth and death. If we did, a mother who knew that a certain son would take more than, from her than he would give would never love him. She would neglect him and might even try to kill him. We would be prejudiced against other people from the start and that would only increase our self-identification with our bodies, which exists solely because of Rinanu Bandhan. And all this would only add to our already heavy load of karmas. That is why one does not get remembrance of past lives until a later stage. So there's a movie, there's a movie called Minority Report. Okay, in that what happens is there are these psychics who are in a pond and they actually predict any crime that is going to happen. It's a, it's a sci-fi kind of a movie. And <clears throat> using that, what they go and the, the police does is that they go and preempt any crime that is going to take place. So they, they stop the crime before it happens. Okay, now, if I already know something, then I can, I, I will definitely get affected by it. So over here again, he's talking about the same thing. That if I if I can actually predict the future totally, but I do not accept it, then I can create a lot of problems for myself and those around me, right? So in a certain way, if you're not evolved enough to be able to accept it, it's better that we don't know what is going to happen. But ultimately, what is the state of consciousness that we are looking for? That we want to expand. We want to get to know stuff. We want to come into a position where we go into acceptance and accept whatever is happening. Okay, that is the game that we are playing. But ultimately, you have to have that conscious awareness to be able to sustain that and handle that. It's a nice movie, uh, Minority Report. We can, I think, maybe we can see a movie one day. Ranu, I have experienced all this myself, you know, which is why I can talk about it. I lost my first son, Ranu, in spite of every precaution, and I did not understand what was going on until much later, when my Guru Maharaj literally beat it into my head. Ranu was meant to die young. That is all there was to it. 
I had plenty of warnings. I had my own suspicions. I did all I could, but there was no way to avoid Mahakal. Jean Chandra Suri, the Jain ascetic who forced me to do Shav Sadhana for the first time, was also involved in this drama. See, how strange are the workings of Rinanu Bandhan. My wife had had several miscarriages and I was wondering if she would ever be able to have a child. Once when she was at her parents' home in Gwalior, Jean Chandra Suri came to me and said, there is an ethereal being who has been coming to me daily and bothering me. I want to come to the world of mortals and play. Let me come, let me come. I have decided that he should be born into your family. Right in front of me, the old man wrote out the horoscope and described exactly how the boy would look. He told me, your wife will conceive on such and such a day. I thought it was a big, all a big joke and told him so. Look, Maharaj, my wife is in Gwalior. How can she conceive there? He didn't bother to reply, but just left. I knew that even in his miserable condition, he still had a few tricks up his sleeves. So, I sent a telegram to my wife telling her there was no need for her to return to Bombay. She should continue her vacation with her family indefinitely. But it's not so easy to prevent the unfolding of your destiny. Someone in Gwalior told my wife, your husband has just been operated on for his tonsils and he is hiding it from you. She took fright and caught the next train for Bombay. When I met her at the station, I realized that it would all take place as Jean Chandra Suri had predicted. My wife conceived on the specified day. The pregnancy was uneventful and the boy was born. At the exact time required by the horoscope, the old man had written out. What's more, the baby fit the physical description perfectly. So again, this uh, Chandra Suri, he was, he was a selfish man, but it's not that he did not have knowledge. It's not that he really uh, did not have a ability, right? So he was evolved. That's why the uh, Vimalananda actually continued the relationship with him also. And so I have Jean Chandra Suri to thank both for introducing me to my mother Tara and for giving me a unique son. You know, Jean Chandra Suri's fate was somehow connected with that of Ranu. Three months before Ranu's death, the old man came to me and said, your child is going to make you cry. He'll make you miserable. And three months after my son was cremated, the old man passed away himself. One day, he was delivering a lecture on the Jain religion in one of their temples, and in the middle of the discourse, he just keeled over dead. What a boy Ranu was. My God, if he had lived, he would have been the best. Sports, studies, you name it. He was tops in all of them. Not only that, he had innate spiritual powers. Sometimes when people would come to me to get some work done, Ranu would meet them first and say, give me some chocolate and I'll see that your work gets done. And it would be done. No one ever understood how. And even I only found out how after he was gone. Everyone who met him loved him. He was my father's favorite and my mother. Here in India, it is tradition that when you take initiation from a guru, you give up one food for the rest of your life. You dedicate that food to your guru. My mother had refused to eat mangoes after Ranu's death because mangoes had been his favorite food, even though obviously he was not her guru. And even my gurus loved him. One day when Ranu was being too mischievous, I raised my hand 
as if to slap him. I would not have done it. I never hit my children. I just wanted to scare him. But my junior Guru Maharaj was in the room. He caught my hand and with real pain in his voice, he said, haven't you ever looked in his palm and seen how short his lifeline is? Promise me you will never strike him. And of course, I did promise it. Actually, I had known from Ranu's horoscope that his life would be in danger early on. And as soon as my second son was born, I looked at his horoscope. I saw that it predicted that he would be the eldest child in the family. This certainly suggested that Ranu had to die. So <clears throat> now, what happens is from one person's horoscope, you can get indications about all other people associated with that person. For example, the first house represents that person. The seventh house represents the partner, right? So if you want to see the horoscope or what the horoscope of the wife is saying, you can look at, turn the horoscope around and make the seventh house the first house and you'll get a prediction. Likewise, the mother is the fourth house. The father is the 10th house or the ninth house. So like that, you can turn the horoscope and actually predict about the rel relatives of the person whose horoscope you're looking at. Okay, so over here, what was he doing? That he saw from his next son's horoscope, the second son's horoscope, that the first son would not be there because he would be the eldest in the family. So I decided to give him the happiest childhood I could. When he was wild and naughty, I would tell him just to punish him a little bit. If you don't behave, your papa will go to where Gopala lives, meaning that I would die. But Ranu would always tell me, no, papa, I will be going before you do. He knew, he knew. Well, Ranu died at age nine. As the time approached, my senior Guru Maharaj decided to visit Bombay. Now I know that he came to say goodbye to Ranu because then I was still hopeful that something could be done. One day, a couple of friends and I were sitting with my senior Guru Maharaj and one friend said to me in English, why don't we try to get your Guru Maharaj to go to the cinema? This fellow knew that my senior Guru Maharaj would never patronize anything like that because he hates the British, which means to him, Westerners in general. He used to say, what have the Westerners ever done for us except to teach us to urinate standing up like donkeys? Anyway, my friend was still talking. Let's take him to a really hot picture. My old man was just looking at him with his piercing stare. He, his eyes never blink. And then suddenly he said in Hindi, why don't we go to see a picture today? I'd like to see that new picture with Rita Hayworth in it. I got the shock of my lifetime. I couldn't understand it. Why should he want to go to see something he hates? And how could he possibly know or care who Rita Hayworth was? But we went. And during the picture, my senior Guru Maharaj didn't even look at the screen. He sat with his head on his chest, covered by his arms, with his elbows together at the waist. Very strange. I didn't know what to make of any of this. If you ever get the opportunity, see that picture. It was called Down to Earth. Danny is a piano player whose, dan whose dancer quits him. He is in bad shape, so his mother, who had died, gets permission to come down from him, heaven to help him. She becomes his dancer. Of course, he does not know who she really is, and then he rockets to fame. They are doing very well together when the first dancer Danny had employed comes back and asks to be rehired. Although his mother tells him, but Danny, I only want to help you. He sends her away and rehires the first dancer and straight away plummets. Then he realizes his mistake and asks his mother to come back. 
she does and up he goes again his mother is finally called back up above there is a limit to everything after all she begs she pleads no i can't go i have to look after my son but then we see a big gandhar or some kind of angel smiling at her and he moves his hand and she leaves the earth and is drawn back up above as she is about to go she sees her son and cries danny danny don't you hear me can't you hear me i want to help you listen to me but danny is drinking at a cocktail party in some producer's house and he can't hear because she has become ethereal up in heaven she is very unhappy my danny what will become of him and someone comes along to talk with her about it she is completely despondent and she he just strokes the back of her head and suddenly she says oh it was all a dream wasn't it and she becomes happy again but still for some time the memory is there like the morning recollection of a dream so everything is a dream ultimately everything is an illusion this is what we are doing in the gita and the other vedanta talks that we are having also that ultimately the waker is not affected by what the dreamer is feeling right or has perceived but while you are in the dream it feels very very real but once you awaken then you know that it was a dream and you uh, become aware that it was all unreal after the picture was over my senior guru maharaj asked us did you understand i said no because i couldn't understand my old man left bombay and some time later ranu died about two months thereafter he returned to bombay and asked me now did you understand that film I still can't tell you how he knew that film was worth seeing to remind me of the story of Ranu's life. Look how Mahakal works. I had gone out of Bombay to Mathroli near Surat in the Konkan for a short while with a certain sadhu, my wife's own guru. In fact, he was named Shankar Giri ji and lived to be about 125. though he was not quite 100 at this time and still looked like a 16 year old boy and i told my wife in no uncertain terms not to have ranu operated on for his tonsils while i was away but she ignored my advice and did it anyway i had a peculiar feeling that something terrible was going to happen then when i learned of the operation i told her specifically that if she let him go to school while i was gone that it would be the end of him well she didn't listen to me she or rather mahakal sent him to school and he developed polio he was sick only 4 days so again many times what happens is that someone evolved is telling you to do something but because of your jid- jiddi pana okay you will not listen and that's where the problem starts happening so we have to know who to listen to who not to listen to where to apply our free will and where not to apply our free will while i was sitting out in the jungle i started seeing something funny i saw that ranu was dying i told shankar giri ji that i had to go back to bombay but he said don't be stupid it's all your imagination don't go back I waited there for some more time and then I saw the same thing again. This time I fought forced Shankar Giri ji to come back with me to Bombay. By the time I got back it was almost too late. I quickly put a Gori Baba stick under the mattress and laid my boy on the bed on top of it. So again when you are in these altered states okay like he is always in the altered state you will get inputs you will get the intuition and the more you act on the intuition this is what we keep saying in the excursion also you get the intuition but at times we do not know that it's an intuition and because of free will we cut it off but the more we are open to these intuitions and the more we act on them 
the more powerfully they will keep coming back into our lives and that is what we are here for you know to open our awareness to become more conscious as to what the universe is telling us and and it's it's a very subtle thing it's a learned thing you know you start getting a feel for it but the ego has to be kept on the side for this intuitive ability to start coming in i then thought that everything would be all right because if agori baba's stick had stayed underneath him ranu could never have died that is the power of the stick agori baba gave it to me long ago and i have used his miraculous powers on so many people my foster daughter used it on me when i had my heart attack i used to ask her why is my bed so lumpy but look how mahakal works Dinkar, my friend who was with me there, told me to go down and get some coconut water for Ranu. While I was gone, Ranu, remember it was Mahakal speaking through Ranu, asked Dinkar to put him on the other bed. Dinkar never knew about Agori Baba's stick and didn't move it along with Ranu. When I came back, my boy was gasping. I lifted him in my arms. He said, "Gopala," and he was gone. he knew he would die he even told the principal of his school now it's time for me to leave i won't be meeting you again i'm going to a place where it is very cold meaning he would be reborn in america and even my in- intellect had become perverted at one point i had prayed let my boy die rather than become a cripple because he had been so good at sports like badminton that his spirit would have been crushed if he had been forced to limp around for the rest of his life that is what polio does to you you know so now this is very important this thing is very important here at one point i had prayed let my boy die rather than become crippled now many times we say certain things you know like we'll tell our children that you know when you become a mo- mother then you will understand what is happening or when you have to earn your uh, bread then you will understand where money comes from and you will understand the pain associated with it now when a parent says that he is putting a curse on the child right so we have to be very consciously aware of what we are telling our children also so this becomes very important because see again we live in a thought responsive universe we may not realize it but whatever we are saying has the probability of manifesting so being aware of what we are thinking and what we are saying becomes extremely important in any case after my ranu died i went mad my position was pitiable i actually had to borrow money to burn him for 6 months i sat in the smashan with one small bone and some ash which i had retrieved from his funeral pyre i was trying to revive him in the same body eventually someone promised me that he would come back to me after being born to different parents carrying certain signs on his body so that i could recognize him so now <clears throat> this is also very possible okay the buddhists have this principle that the <clears throat> they know they they figure out where the dalai lama is going to be born okay so there are two people they uh, uh, they juggle between the two of them there was this ba- uh, book the dalai the dalai lama's cat in that it's very clearly mentioned i think that the next person figures out where the dalai lama is born and when the dalai lama is born he figure out where the other person is born uh, these things are also very well uh, depicted in this book by lopson lamba the third eye it was his big best book and then he wrote about 20 or other books but all this is explained in that very interesting process where they put the uh, the the child they go and locate the child and then he all the stuff that was used by the previous dalai lama is put in front of the child with other stuff and whether the child goes and picks up the stuff that was used by the dalam the dalai lama okay so similarly the signs and the uh, you know like the cuts or the birthmarks etc also can be carried forward 
in the person who is coming into the next body. I refused to meet my junior Guru Maharaj for four years after my son's death. When I finally did go to visit him, I gave him such a barrage of curses that he had no option but to sit and listen to me for two hours. I used all the foul language I knew. And in addition, I was telling him things like, you are a sadhu, so you never had any children. What can you know of the grief of a father who loses his son? He listened to me patiently until I was through and then said quietly, Va Babuji Va. Now I know how strong is the love of human beings. If you really loved your son so much, how is it that you are still alive after his death? Why didn't you die of shock at the moment his, of his death or throw yourself on the funeral pyre with him? You are eating and drinking as if nothing had happened. You are going to the races and enjoying your life. So I understand that this was not real love, but only Rinanu Bandhan, just a debt which had to be paid. So <clears throat> this happens to many people, right? And many times the spouse, the one spouse dies and the other one will also go away at the same time. I was ashamed because I knew that what he said was the truth. Then he told me, come here. And he pressed a certain nerve on the back of my head. And suddenly I understood the Rinanu Bandhan between me and my son and why he had to die. Guru Maharaj told me, there is no need for you to cry. You know, God exists in everyone's heart. If you see your Ranu in everyone you meet, you will have so many Ranus. So I lost one son but gained millions. Wasn't it worth it? And later I realized that by continuing to live, I had been able to do some things for Ranu, which benefited him immensely. I saw to it that he underwent thousands of births during the four years between his death and his reincarnation in human form. Thousands of births in which millions of karmas were wiped out. And in so many of those births, he was sacrificed. It is not necessary for the spirit to enter the womb and actually grow with the fetus. It is sufficient if the spirit enters the animal just a few minutes or hours or days before the sacrifice occurs. And the nice thing about it is that once you are sacrificed in one womb, you never have to take rebirth in that womb again. Never. So what happened? This is a concept of walk-in, right? It is said that the when the baby is in the womb of the mother, the entity which is going to be present in that baby comes and goes. It's not present all the time. Many times the one who was actually coming into the womb decides I don't want to come in and the other person will come in. So over here, what he's saying is that he used to put the spirit of R Ranu into a, a baby which was going to be born and an animal baby. And then when the baby was sacrificed, he again transcended and went up. So a lot of the karma or the Sanchit Vasnas of Ranu, he was able to eliminate by this process. Nikit, I have a question. What, yeah. is, what is Ranu Bandhan? It's debt. It's karmic debt. Karmic debt. Okay. I can predict one characteristic of my son's personality in his new body. Wherever he may be, he will never want to injure any animals and there will be some species of animals of which he will be so fond that he will never be able to endure it if he sees them in pain. All because he has been sacrificed in those forms. When you see a dead animal on the road and a shiver suddenly and involuntarily goes up your spine, somewhere in some previous birth, you must have endured something like that. Perhaps it was not a car. You might have been crushed by anything, even an elephant or a boulder. But subconsciously, the agony is still present. You remember the past experience and shiver uncontrollably. So everything is recorded. Okay. When we are doing biofield tuning, 
we can actually in at the edge of the field we can actually come up across what happened during your birth time what was the position of your mother was she under stress was there a financial issue everything can come out when we are tuning in just at the membrane level and of course there's nothing stopping us from going back although we don't go back but you can actually go into the previous birth also if you just go a little back from where the membrane point is i haven't experimented with it but i'm sure that it can happen if it can happen for this life why can't it happen for the other life so everything is recorded whether we like it or not okay also now the trick is in being able to have the conscious awareness to be able to technically access it nothing more than that and once you develop yourself spiritually you feel not only your own pain but you empathize with the pain of the being who is suffering when you see god in every human every animal even the tiniest insect and even in the vegetables you eat every day you cannot bear to see their torment because it becomes your torment you see god suffering and it is unbearable so you're going into an altered state of consciousness into a higher state of consciousness and you then self start self identifying with everything around you okay so if any the other person suffering becomes your suffering this is what he is explaining here whenever i drive past a certain mutton shop near pune i see rows of goat carcasses and i feel pity for the goats who were slaughtered merely to please someone's tongue one day i got so wild that i said to myself i'll see to it that everyone in this city is burned alive just to make up for the sufferings of the little kid goats who are tethered near the carcasses animals can smell imminent slaughter and they fear death like any other living being how cruel it is to force baby goats to spend 24 hours with the dead bodies of their own kind knowing all the while that in the morning they too will end up on the meat hooks so animals animals can actually feel it and they know it right and whenever they know it the toxins the fear toxins are automatically secreted in the body of the animal so that's why now uh, there are some slaughter houses which take a lot of care before slaughtering the animal and they do it with compassion which becomes important if we saw that movie avatar in that uh, when when they are when they are attacking or killing any of the animal she actually prays to the animal once the arrow is shot and the animal is nearly going to die they say a prayer on the animal before they consume the meat so that becomes very important you know with what state of mind what state of consciousness are you doing the killing becomes extremely important i was so wild that day that i was ready to invoke any spirit just to finish off everyone in the town and teach them a good lesson in sensitivity suddenly some ethereal beings sneered at me you fool who are you to pity them at least they know when they are going to die their suffering is limited to a day but you have no idea when you are going to die or how much you will have to suffer who deserves pity they or you and then i had to keep quiet because every word was true let me assure you though that it is better not to know when you are going to die unless you are an advanced yogi and sometimes not even then if i had not known ranu was going to die i would still have felt the hurt at his death no doubt but how much more did i feel it when i knew it all beforehand and could do absolutely nothing about it it is a real blessing from nature that we are born we forget our renanu bandhans otherwise people most people would not be able to endure the misery of existence only those who need to know are finally permitted to know so that they can go beyond renanu bandhan and for those few who do know there is nothing more relieving than the grip of mahakal the grip which signals that soon they will be free of the responsibility of remaining alive swimming in the shark filled ocean of the material world so again it's a matter of expanding consciousness and again it's not easy to know when you're going to die right you can get really scared 
So you have to have a very, very evolved state of consciousness to be able to know stuff and still be okay with it. Author's postscripts. Ranu's story exemplifies Vimla Nand's whole teaching about Rinanu Bandhan, a true tale of how a being takes birth, plays about, pays off debts and departs, once those debts have been paid. The story of Ranu would not be complete, however, without appending the story of Vimla Nand's father to it. Since... Since this tale involves me personally, I have deliberately written it in first person from my point of view. During the summer of 1978, Vimla Nand predicted that his father would die in his sleep before the end of the year. I had already experienced Vimla Nand's accuracy in predicting the date and time of an individual's demise. It surprised me then when the year was ending and the foretold death had not yet occurred. So generally, generally speaking, people or astrologers do not like to predict the death. Okay, but he had the quality of actually seeing it. In everyone's horoscope, there are certain marks or certain combinations of the planets that are formed, which say that okay, it is a deadly time. It may be a time when you will may be may have to transcend, but it's not fixed. At times, you know, unless you have really real, real accuracy in reading, which I have not experienced anyone having that much of accuracy. But it seems that Vimalananda had it. We were in Bombay to celebrate Christmas and New Year's when on the night of December 30th, I told Vimalananda, you assured me your papa would pass on during this year. What happened? He is still alive. Vimalananda replied, there is still one day left in the year, isn't there? Let it go by first and then tell me anything you like. Suddenly, for no apparent reason, a dog began to howl piteously on the street below. We later discovered that he had been locked in the post office located in our building on the ground floor and was howling to try to attract attention to his plight. According to the science of omens, however, the mourning, mournful baying of a dog in the night is an exceedingly inauspicious sign. So again, the universe, I mean, the universe has many telltale signs. And over a period of time, you can actually start to be able to understand what these signs mean. The phone rang at 5 a.m. the next morning to announce that Vimla Nand's father had died in his sleep during the night. About the same time, the dog had begun to wail. As Vimlanan hung up the phone, he turned to me with a big, I told you so grin and said, now what do you have to say? Okay, so another, <laughs> another fact over here is there's this, I, I think I mentioned it before, there's this book by uh, Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, How Do Dogs Know That Their Owner Is Coming Home? Okay, so animals are very sensitive. Their, uh, uh, their ability to perceive in many, many ways is far exceeding our own. As we enter the old man's room to pay our last respects, Vimla Nand sighed contentedly and whispered to me, look at that face. Then he pointed to a picture on the wall, which was obviously one of the old man done just a short while before his demise. For the features tallied almost precisely with those of the dead face before me. That fellow on the wall is Haranath Thakur, our family guru. Vimlanand continued. My father concentrated on his picture for so many years that he became like his guru even in physical form. This is a practical demonstration of the Kita Brahmari Nyaya, the law of caterpillar and butterfly. Whatever you concentrate on, you will eventually become. So your thoughts are what create your thoughts are what create you, right? You are what your thoughts are at the end of the day. 
So if you're concentrating and thinking of someone, slow and steady, you will start behaving, you will start uh, becoming that person. This is what NLP also talks about, neuro-linguistic programming. Suppose you want to be successful in a certain career or a certain activity. So what NLPers will say is that you find out what exactly that person who was successful has been doing and then you mirror what that person is doing so that you can become successful. Now, my ideas are slightly different because if you're going to be mirroring another person, then what is your essence? Where will your essence go? And you can never perfectly mirror another person. So there is a challenge in this mirror, mirroring, but ultimately what is there? That if you're focusing or concentrating on one person, you will become like that person. That is why even husband and wife, after a certain point in time, they really start looking like each other also. Actually, there's a better reason for this, he mused on. In 1927, my father came down with meningitis and died. Yes, he died. I can show you death certificates signed by three different doctors. We received a message from Haranath immediately. Don't remove the body for 12 hours after death. All our relatives said, don't be stupid. He's dead now. Let's cremate him. But my mother had implicit faith in her guru and she was adamant. After six hours, the corpse sat up. He lived for another 51 years. So, as I, I was saying before, it normally takes 24 hours for the energy or that spirit to really disconnect totally from the body. Until that energy is there, the spirit can come back. That's why the bodies were kept in state in many uh, religions. Okay. You can also have a walk-in at that time. Now the spirit which was occupying that body has left. But now another spirit says that, okay, this body is still work workable for me. I will come into the body and use the body. Okay. So this is what happened over here. Either his energy came back or he became a different person. Many times this happens when people have NDEs, near-death experiences. And after that experience, the characteristics of the person also can undergo a serious change. Okay, so he died, he flatlined, but then he came back. A few days later, my father received a letter from Haranath. My son, you will have a long life, but you will never see your Haranath anymore. Look after my boy, meaning me. I was 11 at the time. A cover letter from Haranath's son was enclosed which stated that on such and such day at such and such time, his father had gone to sleep in his garden after mentioning that he felt my father needed his help. Haranath never woke up from that sleep. The time he went to sleep turned out to be exactly the moment my father revived. So what happened? Haranath came into the body of the father, literally speaking. He transcended and then the spirit came into his father. After this experience, my father was a changed man. Although he had not much interest in his business before, after this incident, he lost all interest in business and would spend his time doing japa, or discussing spiritual subjects with my mother. I think there must have been some connection between his revival and his guru's death. Vimlanand made some further observations about his father's corpse, noting that there were no flies around the body and that abstemious living had made the body itself almost as light as that of a child. Both things he attributed to the old man's purity. So when a person who passes away is very pure, flies will not come, the decomposition of the body will not take place. Rigor mortis does not set in so fast, depending on the evolution of the soul. At the Banganga Smashan, Vimlanan insisted on arranging the pyre himself. I always arrange the pyres for my family's funerals. It's my job. The smashan is my home. 
I think I should know best how it is to be done. After igniting the pyre, Vimlanand called me over and he and I made offerings of clarified butter into it as if we were worshipping a sacrificial fire, according to the traditional ritual. No one dared stop us, though there was visible agitation in the audience at the scandal. of a son openly performing ritual worship on his own father's funeral pyre. Later, as we sat quietly smoking and watching the pyre burn, I mentioned this to Vimlanand. He laughed a hearty laugh and said, What does my family know about me? I have never shirked from doing anything I felt I needed to do. I don't know why it is, but I will do most anything just for the experience of it. I'll do it once or twice just so I know. I can do it well and then quit so it doesn't become a habit. Agora is my life though. I have always lived in the Smashan and as an Aghori, I cannot afford to distinguish between the funeral pyre of my mother or my father and that of anyone else. <clears throat> How can I? No sadhana means sadhana, however you look at it. You must be ready to forget everything to become an aghori. So again, <clears throat> over here, I will do almost anything just for the experience of it. Right? So the more we experience, the more we grow. That's why we should always be look out for new experiences. Again, I've mentioned this before, but... Many times we'll ask this question in the excursion workshops and the other workshops. When was the last time you did something new? And, you'll, and, and I see blank faces all the time because people are doing the same routine thing all the time. They're not willing to take the leap of faith to do go and do something new. Okay. And now, when you become an agora, what are you doing? You're disconnecting from the material world. You are connecting with the spiritual world. So everything is the same to you. Whether it is your mother's prayer or your father's prayer. It doesn't mean that you're not going to do your duty, whatever your duty is, but then you will not leave an opportunity also. I had the same idea at my mother's, mother's funeral. In fact, I asked my friend, shall I perform a little sadhana here? It will give us great material benefits. But they turned me down. He fell silent. For a couple of hours, we chatted intermittently, apart from voices, only the hiss of the dying pyre's flames, the cawing of a few raucous purple and black jungle crows, and the splash of ocean breakers just beyond the retaining wall disturbed the stillness of the smashan. Eventually, Vimlanand said jauntily, let's go see if the old man has turned to ash yet. On inspection, only a few bone slivers remained among the piles of ash. After collecting some of these splinters for later rituals, we walked back to the car to drive home. A broad smile illumined his face as Vimlanan told me, Tonight, we'll celebrate New Year's Eve with champagne. I feel I really have some reason to celebrate. My father had succeeded at his sadhana and had a fine death. As we head into the new year, he has got a good head start into a new life. A life those of us who live in the Smishan know very, very well. So he knew where his father was going, right? So if you have the knowledge of what is going to happen after death, then the fear of death definitely starts getting transmuted. You're not scared of so much of death anymore. Should we stop here? Yeah, naturally we'll stop here.